Good afternoon, everybody. It is noon central time, so it is now officially the afternoon. Thank you so much for coming in and joining us today for our Earth Day Shed Talk. Uh, and we've got a really fun uh, day afternoon plan for you. We do have something. There it is. I was going to say, we've got a little fun screen for us, so I wanted to get that started. But welcome, everybody. Come on in. Take some time. Get comfortable. We have an incredible hour planned for you. Uh, one of my favorite people here at Shed is going to be sharing some of the incredible research uh, and boots on the ground work that they do. Um, so you're definitely going to want to grab a seat. Come on in. I'm going to give it just another minute or so for folks to navigate our digital space. Uh, I know for me yesterday I had to completely update Zoom, so I just want to give folks time to update things uh, on their platforms. But welcome. So excited to have everybody here today. My name is Brian. Uh, I don't think I mentioned that earlier, but I'm going to be your host today. It's not going to be about me, though. Uh, it's going to be about all the incredible things that Shed Aquarium is doing. And thanks to your support, we are able to do so. Uh, so it looks like we've got well over 25 people here. We've got... Um, uh, coming up to 26 people now. So I'm going to move ahead just really quickly because uh, while we have uh, everybody's attention, I want to bring up this other screen, which is uh, a really fun, interactive, engaging tool that I want to share with all of you. So before we actually jump into everything, I'm going to put this up here for the folks that are trickling in because I am going to give it just another minute. Uh, it's 12.02, so we'll get started here in another minute around 12.03 or 12.04. However, up on the screen, you should be seeing this, uh, these words, uh, what does water conservation mean to you? If you have a smartphone, feel free to scan that QR code, so pull up your camera. You should be able to hold it up to it and then a little box will come in and if you just press on that it should take you to this this slide um, but feel free to share so that way we can all sort of be entering this space on the same footing and see where everything is okay so we've got some folks that are starting to answer so i'm just going to show the answers here uh, but please feel free to take this minute or two i'm going to give it one more minute here before we dive in uh, and talk about all things water and water conservation but um, I've got a bunch of stuff blocking my screen here. So uh, let me just move some things around. I know you can't see that, but I'm just going to share what I'm doing, my process. Uh, so, okay, this is awesome. We've got some folks that say clean water, saving the world, water conservation. Yes, protecting and preserving our water resources for us and aquatic life. I love that. Saving aquatic life, the future, using only what we need and not damaging what we don't use. Yes, uh, not using more than you need. Yes, I love all this. This is this is fantastic. Thank you all so much for sharing uh, your answers and taking the risk of uh, engaging with us in this way. All right, I think I've given enough folks time to enter in to get used to this space. So without further ado, uh, thank you all for indulging me with that incredible sharing. Um, but let me jump right back into the PowerPoint here. All right, so friends, welcome once again to our Earth Day uh, Shed Talk. Today we're going to be using webinar. Now, webinar mode of Zoom means a couple of things. It means that we are able or I am able to sort of direct and show folks what it is we want to see, but you might not be able to interact with one another. However, you'll be able to interact with me. Speaking of... I have just sent a message in the chat function. So if you are new to Zoom and if you are on a computer, if you press and hold Alt plus H, the chat window will pop up. If you're on a different device, maybe a tablet or a phone, if you hover your finger or press in the center uh, of it, there should be a little pop-up window with a little chat bubble icon. So if you pull that up, see it. Excellent. We've got Jason who's joining us from Nashville. That is awesome. Uh, and now friends, while our host is is talking and sharing their work with us, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions. So there's a couple of ways that we can get those questions uh, and get them answered. The first one is there should be a Q&A function just next to the chat function on the tooltip that pops up. Um, or you can use this chat function to distribute your questions throughout and we'll be able to pull from them in that Q&A time. So just remember there is going to be some time dedicated at the very end to our Q&As. All right, 
now that we've got all of that, um, oh, we need to record. Oh, we are recording. Perfect. So let's just continue and jump on in because I don't want to take any more of your time with my face. I want to introduce our incredible Dr. Karen Murchie, who is the Director of Freshwater Research here at Shedd Aquarium. And so now I'm going to spotlight Dr. Murchie. How are you today, Dr. Murchie? Yes. Hi, everyone in Zoom land. Uh, I'm doing <laughs> really great. Thank you. I'm Excellent. excited to be here. All right. Well, I will let you take it over because you have a lot to talk about, and I am so pumped to hear what you have to share. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, I am Karen Murchie, as Brian said, and uh, if you're not familiar with my role at SHED, I am the Director of Freshwater Research, which, which means I oversee a team of biologists that are focused on conserving um, different animals from amphibians to freshwater mussels um, to understanding how aquatic organisms make a living in urban environments. And then I also am the person that runs Shed's Migratory Fish Program. And I'm actually joining you from Door County, Wisconsin, where I'm currently doing some sucker research right now. Um, but in addition to doing the, the research on the migratory fishes, I spend a lot of time working with a global network of biologists and researchers and um, conservationists that are focused on understanding and celebrating freshwater biodiversity. It's all linked together. Um, and maybe I wanna get you to start thinking too about the fact that freshwater is life. And um, I know we already had the Mentimeter question of, of asking what um, water conservation means to you. And, and I think along those lines, um, you can think to yourself, how many times have you used fresh water today? Uh, maybe for drinking, bathing, cooking, et cetera. Um, these are some important things and we cannot live without fresh water. We know that, um, but it's also a home to some absolutely extraordinary animals. And, um, even though fresh water itself takes up less than 1% of the Earth's total surface, there's more than half of the known diversity of fish species in that small fraction of water. A fun fact um, is that the majority of the world's population also lives within a couple miles of a river. So fresh water and freshwater life is around us. But we don't always necessarily think about some of the other ways that freshwater biodiversity has a role in our lives. Um, but in a lot of part of the world, it's a very important food source and in fact feeds 200 million people and supports the livelihoods for 60 million folks. And of the fish that are captured in inland or freshwater fisheries, the majority of it, 90%, is actually used for human consumption. And that's, again, a really important protein source for a lot of the world where they're not eating other things like beef or chicken, uh, et cetera. So um, that's a, an important consideration. And the fisheries associated with freshwater has a very large economic value, um, 122 billion US dollars, but I suspect that is even an underestimate. So Brian, next slide. Despite all those cool things that I mentioned of how important freshwater biodiversity is and, and just starting to give a snapshot of the number of roles uh, that, that biodiversity plays, Sadly, freshwater biodiversity loss is in a severe decline. Um, this figure here really highlights, we've seen a downward trend in biodiversity globally, whether that's organisms that live in the oceans or our terrestrial counterparts, but where we've seen the absolute most devastating declines is in freshwater. And this seems to be continuing somewhat under the radar. Scientists and 
conservations know about this, but we're having a hard time capturing people's attention to, um, to bend that curve and to make some changes. Next slide. So what are some of the reasons that we might be overlooking freshwater biodiversity uh, as humanity? Well, there's a few potential reasons, and one could be the fact that even when we say seafood, I like to eat seafood, that term implies that we're eating fish and other um, organisms from the ocean. But again, a lot of the world relies on capture fisheries from inland lakes and rivers. And um, so that alone could be one challenge. For anybody that's in the Great Lakes region too, um, you know, our water is getting clear due to invasive species like freshwater um, invasive mussels, the zebra mussels and the quagga mussels. But often if you're walking alongside Lake Michigan and you take a peek in, you're not necessarily gonna see fish swimming around. Um, so it's often a little bit harder to understand, oh yes, this is where we have a lot of uh, animals living and calling home. Um, whereas if you're walking along the beach in Florida, along the ocean, you might see some fish swimming along easily. And even in terms of some other recreation like diving, um, the waters in a good chunk of the world in fresh water are pretty cold, or even in the Amazon where it's a lot warmer, um, we can often have really turbid or murky waters that make it difficult to see in. So, and of course, one of the great things that SHED provides is an opportunity to sort of pull back that curtain of obscurity and we can see, oh my gosh, there's tons of really cool animals that live in the Great Lakes and the Amazon and other freshwater systems in the world. But again, that could be something that is creating a barrier for celebrating uh, freshwater biodiversity and getting more people behind um, rallying for less biodiversity loss. Also, when we think of some animated movies, I know certainly when I'm on the floor uh, at Shed, I often hear kids and see them tugging along their parents saying, let's go find Dory or Nemo. Um, but there also isn't an equivalent of that kind of a story celebra celebrating freshwater species. There's no um, finding Sally the sturgeon or Samuel the sucker. Uh, so that could be another reason that contributes to our, our lack of understanding of freshwater species. And also, as the world continues to become more and more urbanized, um, we often find ourselves less and less connected with the nature that we're a part of. Um, so again, that dissociation with our place in nature can, can lead to um, that challenge. And I mentioned earlier too, um, we have a lot of protein sources as options here in the US. So again, we don't necessarily have it on our radar per se um, about the importance of freshwater organisms as a food source. Next slide. And we use fresh water in so many ways, again, from drinking, that consumption personally, but also we consume fresh water in a number of ways from industry, uh, from agriculture, and power generation. Um, so a lot of the world relies on hydropower as an energy source, but even other um, power generation is often fairly water intensive. And again, all those ways that we use it are very human centric and we don't often think about, oh yeah, the places that we're pulling water from for agriculture, for industry, our lakes, our rivers, that's home for so many organisms from plants to animals and so on. And there's a number of threats. We're in our oceans, some of the biggest threats to the organisms there are, or is overfishing uh, and climate change, um, of course, pollution and so on too. But I'd say that the, again, uh, the smaller footprint of fresh water and how close humans are to um, rivers and so on, the pollution, the overuse, 
um, filling in wetlands to um, build new subdivisions, that kind of development, uh, along with still the potential for overfishing, climate change, and invasive species are all pretty big threats to these systems. And so for all the freshwater species that we are aware of, and that depends solely on freshwater as a home, 27% are uh, threatened with extinction, according to the International Union for the Convention on Nature. Um, uh, but I suspect too, that number would be even higher if there were full assessments on all of the freshwater species out there. And this is something that all of us need to take to heart and we can all rally behind in our own ways. So next slide. So the, the loss of freshwater biodiversity is definitely a problem, but the world has a myriad of problems. Everything from poverty and hunger to access clean water for health and sanitation. So the world set out um, with 17 ambitious goals that were decided upon in 2015 that we need to achieve by 2023 to um, be more sustainable and create a more just and equitable world. Um, so I'm. this might not be so easy for you to read, but I, uh, the sustainable development goal number 14 has a call out for addressing challenges to life underwater. And you might think, well, that's awesome. You know, the, the world's leaders are thinking about um, freshwater biodiversity loss and so on. So we've got a lot of good people working on this. Well, you might be surprised to find out that even global leaders um, completely overlooked freshwater organisms in the world's sustainable development goals. Life underwater, all of the goal and the target is completely ocean centric. Um, so that's pretty interesting. So next slide, Brian. Working as a part of the network um, called Inland Fish and Fisheries, which again is a very large global network of folks focused on freshwater fish and other organisms, mollusks, crayfish, et cetera. Um, a number of us had started to write some papers to try to get the attention of policymakers and world leaders. Uh, and one of them had come out in the journal Nature Sustainability uh, in 2022 that highlighted, hey, so the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals are incredible, ambitious goals worthy to work towards. But did you know that if we have healthy freshwater systems and healthy, sustainable freshwater fisheries, these alone can help us achieve so many of the other sustainable development goals. So that's been uh, another important role um, in my position at SHED is participating in these types of exercises. And then we followed up with a, a paper that came out a couple of years later that talks about here are some ways, even though you can't change um, the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know, they were uh, kicked off in 2015 and we're working towards them in 2030. Here's some ways that we can write into global, regional, and local policy ways to pay attention to these types of things. Next slide. And so I was super proud of being an author on a publication that just came out uh, at the beginning of, gosh, was it February now, of this year. I'm one of 22 authors from 16 countries. And we wrote this paper called People Need Freshwater Biodiversity. Because again, if we kind of put things in a, a human centric um, vantage point, maybe we'll do even better at um, having our message resonate with folks. So what we outline in this paper is nine ecological services that freshwater biodiversity provide. So everything again from 
the material services like food. Um, I know I mentioned the importance of fish as a protein source, inland fish as a protein source for so much of the world, but you might not have thought of it that rice that feeds more than 50% of the world's population is a freshwater plant. So that's a pretty big take home message. And then of course, in our region in the Great Lakes, we can think of the importance of recreation and culture that freshwater biodiversity is so important to um, people out recreational angling or even just getting out to kayak and or sit along the beach in front of shed. If we have healthy freshwater ecosystems, which are a result of having a healthy biodiverse um, group of organisms living in there, that supports our enjoyment of these systems. And then even the opportunity for things like in the face of climate change, our freshwater biodiversity um, can really help with that. The more severe storms and we have runoff, our wetlands are buffering and filtering out pollutants that are gonna not enter our waterways that we pull our drinking water from. So really, um, I'm so happy to say that within a few months of this paper coming out, We've had a number of media outlets um, really taking this information up and, and running with it. And this paper coming out was the impetus for my invite to a really exciting um, conference this year that I'm really gonna focus the rest of the talk on, which was my participation in the United Nations Water Conference this year. 2023 marked the first year since that the United Nations has held a conference focused on fresh water since 1977. It's almost shocking to believe that it was that long between a conference focused on something so important. The majority of the conference was really highlighted a lot around Sustainable Development Goal 6, which is clean water. Um, for sanitation and hygiene for all, but there's so many layers again at being able to achieve that sustainable development goal. So this was just held less than a month ago um, at the Uni United Nations headquarters in New York City. And um, a statement from the, the United Nations Water Conference page is just saying, Water is a deal maker for the sustainable development goals and for the health and prosperity of people and planet. But our progress on water related goals and targets remains alarmingly off track, jeopardizing the entire sustainable development agenda. So uh, next slide. So getting to be at the United Nations was an absolutely incredible opportunity for me um, to, to take this all in, to be in the rooms where it happens um, and hear discussions. Uh, I was literally in the room with kings and prime ministers uh, and very high level um, policy makers from across the globe. So the gravity of these discussions was absolutely incredible. Um, and I have to say that through it all, I was moved to tears a number of times to hear things, um, you know, being reminded that a quarter of the global population, that like 2 billion people don't have access to safe drinking water. Half of humanity live without safely managed sanitation and one in three people lack basic hand-washing facilities. Um, and, and ultimately too, some of the um, comments about how droughts could be the next pandemic. And uh, we really have to think about too, almost three quarters of recent disasters are water related, again, from one end of the spectrum of being droughts to the other end of the spectrum being damaging floods and how much that's costing um, the world collectively. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. So in some of the sessions that I was able to sit in, uh, we heard commitments from different countries of what they're going to do to help with water conservation, what they're going to do to um, 
to work with neighboring countries to help manage shared water resources. Um, a, a big component was thinking about we have to not think of water as a, as a commodity, we have to think of it as a human right. But another uh, equally important aspect that was shared as well was thinking about making sure freshwater biodiversity and the connecting terrestrial ecosystems are able to do their job that helps provide that good, clean freshwater that we can all use. And if we think of the water cycle um, and how much like one water droplet can move from a lake to a river out to the ocean or get pulled up into a cloud and rain somewhere else, um, again, that hydrological cycle is a, is a global cycle. Uh, so what happens in one country definitely affects what's happening elsewhere. So those are some really big messages um, and, and huge parts of the discussion that I got to be um, a part of. Next slide. So it was uh, also really moving to hear from some youth that were able to participate in the conference and share their voice and say, we need to be included in these discussions because this is really gonna be affecting us the most. And a lot of Indigenous leaders were there, but still only a fraction of all the Indigenous people that uh, exist. And again, we need to be hearing more voices um, and, and listening to solutions that are already out there. Uh, another comment uh, as well that was really well represented is the importance of giving women leadership roles in water management. Um, because where women are empowered, it, it brings a lot of success. So uh, it was an incredible bunch of days at the conference and associated um, side events as well. And again, just getting to participate and listen and think about how I can incorporate what I've learned from the conference and how we can continue to do the work that SHED does to play our role in advocating for uh, aquatic animals. Um, it, it was really special. So next slide, Brian. Uh, the, the good news is, and this is very good news, is we have all the solutions. There's, there's nothing that, you know, is shocking in terms of ways that we can make changes. Um, I think ultimately it comes down to the political will to implement them. But in terms of things that you yourself could do, um, there was a great resource from the United Nations Water Action Guide. So again, some simple things of um, turning off appliances and lights when you're done using them because 90% um, of power production uses a lot of water. There's always opportunities to write your elected representatives um, to encourage them to choose bills um, that are going to support water conservation and reduced pollution, both at home and abroad. And everybody has their own unique skill of what they can do to help share that message. So um, some of you might be artists, some of you might be poets, um, some of you might be politicians. We all have, again, our own unique role that we can play. So um, Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who is an ocean advocate, she talks a lot about identifying your um, advocacy superpower. And I think that resonates, again, whether it's oceans, freshwater, it's all connected, um, but figure out what you can do and, and do it. And there's a lot of fantastic resources that if your um, curiosity is piqued to read more, the, uh, I, am, I know our team at SHED is going to provide a follow-up email with some additional resources that you can check out. And one last little nugget of information, um, choosing our clothing and uh, how often we um, invest in new pieces in our wardrobe can impact water. Um, I thought this was quite a, quite a number, but 10,000 liters of water is used to produce one pair of jeans. Yeah. So um, hang on to those 
uh, pants a little bit longer and, uh, you know, think of doing clothing swaps if you have to, uh, um, you know, if you still have a good pair of pants, but they're no longer for you. Um, that's, that's a really important one, again, that we can think about those things um, in our day to day choices. So with that, I think that was uh, my wow. Last one. <laughs> yes oh a my lot gosh of information and i i can tell you after that conference brian my my <laughs> head was spinning and um and again the the gravity of the conversations throughout was i felt just so grateful to be a part of it and i'm motivated even further um of doing more <laughs> mm. well yes and, and i think uh all the people that are joining us and, and listening to this experience uh, are, uh, at least I am, galvanized to help go out and do our part because, uh, yes, I know we had Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson in one of our, um, I think it was immersion uh, mm -hmm. last year. And yeah, being that advocate um, in the way that you can, I think is really inspirational. Um, and I know we've got some questions. Um, we've, we'll have a, a time dedicated to it. However, before we do that, something really, really fun uh, that I think I want to share with everybody is now that we've listened to Dr. Murchie and describing the importance of freshwater ecosystems, I've got another Mentimeter section and engagement that I want to share with all of you. So I'm going to reshare my screen and once again, get your phones out ready to scan that QR code because... Now that we've had this chat, what does, uh, what's one word that now you will use to describe water? Um, any word, just one word, you should be able to put multiple uh, entries in there. Um, but like, oh, I love this, essential. Oh. Yes, okay. Uh, I'm gonna have so much fun with this, <laughs> with this. Yes, life, 100%. Uh, I think most of these slides <laughs> that, that we were uh, going through and talking about were related to the life and the essential need of it. Oh, blue, beautiful. Yes, important planet, 100%. It's amazing to see how interconnected uh, all of these words are. And of course, just the nature of water, how we're all interconnected. Beautiful, yes. Critical, clean, very important. I love this. Okay, well, I'm gonna have this sort of word cloud be on in the background because we don't need to really see a Q&A slide to know that it is Q&A time. So Dr. Murchie, we've already yes. got some questions popping up. So I'm just going to jump right in as we see our word cloud expand and span. So uh, Christina and Jacob would like to know, are there any agricultural products that use less water than others? Do you know off, off the top of your head? Do you mean like food products? I'm not, I think I need a little clarification on that. I'm going to assume yes, like food and uh, in not necessarily like equipment for agriculture, but how we mm. humans rely on agriculture and the relationship between that and our water usage. Well, if I understand the question correctly, I mean, I, I definitely, there are some crops that are, are super water intensive. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's not an area by any means that I'm an expert in, but I certainly know things like almonds are, are super water intensive. Oh, wow. um, so we, we, one of the things that we've done as well, um, because of the importance of growing food is we've expanded agriculture and we grow crops in some areas where normally the conditions wouldn't be right. And because we can rely on um, watering our crops when nature doesn't do it for us, um, that means that we've often had to divert water uh, into reservoirs to use for that uh, scenario. So particularly when we think of the use of the Colorado River um, and uh, how many states rely on it for so many things, agriculture being part of it. Um, a lot of the crops, again, 
particularly now that we're seeing shifts with climate change, um, areas becoming more dry than they were before and, and not receiving as much rainfall. We're going to see that, um, you know, crops that maybe weren't necessarily destined to be grown in that region um, because the, the climate in terms of rain and everything weren't there naturally, but because we could irrigate, um, they've been able to grow there. Um, I think we're going to have to rethink maybe um, some crops, like if we've got regions that are now um, more prone to being dry, what are some agricultural products that are actually naturally good to grow in those areas? So I yeah. I gave a an example, but this it's <laughs> certainly not um, something where I'm like super savvy and knowledgeable about other than like broadly understanding um, that, you know, so much of where we grow crops, um, we've made new conditions to make it possible in those regions to do so. Yeah, which which that. I think is is really a cool advancement in just human nature uh, and our ability to to help and advance um, where we are. Okay, so uh, another question, Dr. Murchie. I know, and these are going to get more intense as we go on. And luckily, you're here to answer those. I'm ready. So, okay, let's go back to uh, what we're doing to help protect freshwater. So, what research or work is Shed Aquarium doing? as an institution uh, to help better protect our freshwater ecosystems here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, I'll start in the in the here with At Shed. Um, again, the opportunity to look nature in the eye, whether we're talking about animals in freshwater systems locally, like our, our Great Lakes exhibit, or moving to the Amazon exhibit and, and seeing the amazing diversity of animals that live in those habitats, but also that, again, the revealing what it looks like to come face to face with animals from that region and, and sparking that curiosity mm -hmm. to learn more. Oh, I didn't know, um, you know, this particular location in the Amazon, these, these species were declining. What can I do wow. um, to help that? So that's an example of that here. And, and again, sharing and getting people excited about um, seeing those animals and the, the their side of things um, locally around Shed in the Chicagoland area. Our conservation action team is out in the community engaging volunteers to do cleanups of invasive species. So even terrestrial species, invasive plants like buckthorn, yeah. by removing them from our forest preserves and other areas, that's a way to bring back amphibian breeding habitat. Um, so that's another great example, picking up trash along the beach, getting out and kayaking and going, wow, the Chicago River is cool. Oh my gosh, look at, <laughs> there's painted turtles sunning themselves on a rock there. Oh, or, oh my goodness a beaver. Cool. <laughs> and as you're in a kayak and you're kayaking along in the river, you're getting dripped on with water from the, the river itself. And that helps you go, wow, I want to be out here. I want this water to be clean for me. And also now I'm seeing the animal, some of the animals that are calling um, that home. And of course, then I mentioned our, our freshwater research locally yep. too, that connects that are here and, and there. And then in terms of everywhere are our opportunities of engaging guests, no matter where they are in the world, um, from the Zoom now uh, that we're doing, where I think there's probably people scattered from all parts of the states and maybe mm -hmm. outside of the US. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and following along with Shed Social and, uh, and contributing to Shed's mission uh, to continue to do the work that we're doing that again connects humans to the aquatic life that yeah. again we're we all everything that we do to protect our aquatic animals we're giving back to ourselves as humans because it's all connected so yeah. 
hundred percent. Uh, yeah, and I love that. We, we are all connected, and when one area does well, that's going to set up the other area to do well as well. So I mm-hmm. love that. Um, okay, our next question is about freshwater reservoirs around. Illinois and around Chicago in particular, are there any areas off the top of your head that you can name uh, that need cleanup or revitalization more so than others? So even within the Great Lakes themselves, um, on both the U.S. and the Canadian side, there are still um, some locations that are designated as areas of concern that Mm -hmm. have had historical contamination from industry. um, And that's those are still areas that we collectively uh, on both sides of the border are working to clean up um, through federal, um, state, provincial, uh, non-governmental organizations. Yeah, sadly, in our own backyard and in, in wow. the, one of the, the most incredible resources, the Great Lakes themselves, the Laurentian Great Lakes, I'll say when we say Great Lakes, if you uh, there are more than our five Great Lakes between Canada and the U.S., there's also the African Great Lakes as well. So we refer to the ones in North America as the Laurentian Great Lakes. Um, that's 21% of the world's surface freshwater. What a, oh, wow. what a gift and how important is it for us to be good stewards mm-hmm. of such an amazing um, home and source of life. Uh, so I think I started to lose track with my thoughts on that. (laughs) Um, yeah, we need to, we need to certainly, um, take care of fixing up some past damage that we've done to the Great Lakes and same too with, um, wetlands. Um, you know, we might've, we've lost a lot of our wetlands because of development, Um, filling them in. And so there are opportunities to restore some and there's opportunities to create create new wetlands um, throughout the region. Well, I love that. It's it's very helpful, right? Because it's it we have that opportunity. And it's just a matter of capitalizing on it. And I think everybody uh, on this Zoom call, um, friends, yeah, join us for one of our action days over the summer because we're literally going to these places uh, and helping to revitalize and remove invasive species, things like that. So that is an opportunity that all of us uh, can really do our part and pitch in and help. Okay, moving on. I know. Lots of questions, Karen. This is amazing. I love it. Uh, and just a reminder for folks, I want to do a little quick time check. We've got a couple more minutes uh, scheduled for this Q&A session. So don't hesitate. Go down there um, and throw in your questions. Okay. Moving on, how does Shed Aquarium work with indigenous populations to gain and share freshwater knowledge? Because I know you talked about that representation being lacking at the UN. So what are some things that we can do in our sphere of influence here with our indigenous folks? I I think um, all of us uh, as individuals too um, can do more to learn uh, and, and think about indigenous viewpoints. Um, something that I've learned and, I, and I've uh, done online courses, um, I did a, a one called Indigenous Canada and it was quite a, a long course, but so valuable. Again, just sort of thinking about, um, you, we'll stick with the nature concept, but um, not looking at things as resources, but instead, looking at other animals as kin and and being there, it's a relational um, viewpoint. And I think just you, that simple mind shift of how we look at the rest of the world um, is, is a big one. Um, so I think just as individuals, we, we have that opportunity um, to learn. And I will say that um, I've been fortunate as well to work with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife uh, Commission to understand um, the role of suckers, the migratory fishes that my research at SHED is focused on, um, understanding, you know, what have they seen over time in the regions where Indigenous people have been like relying on the land and the rivers for so long. So 
Um, I think there's a number of ways, but I think there's more opportunities um, to do more listening and understanding and collectively um, being more open to a, a knowledge base that <laughs> has existed for much <laughs> longer uh, than, than our time here. Yeah, and has relied on it for for a lot longer than we have too. Yeah, uh, and, and this is great because this goes into our next question great. here um, about sharing that knowledge. So earlier on, you you showed us that you worked with twenty one other uh, incredible folks from sixteen different countries. Yeah. So the question is about what was that experience like working with all of that different perspective and all of those that, that different knowledge? How did you connect? with all of those folks from different areas. I think this is one of those things too, where um, that collaboration is, is key to solving all of our world's problems. Collaborating. What? Yeah. No. I know. Shocking. <laughs> and uh, in having diversity and voices from so many areas too, because if we kind of just focus on um you know, how people in North America rely on freshwater biodiversity, we would have a very different picture than, and particularly on the food side of things, if we weren't getting voices um, from folks in Cambodia and, and, um, and Uganda and so on. So it's, a, that's a really important one too, because um, our, our, experiences lived and and our knowledge um in terms of what we've been exposed to um it is still a, a pretty small view so it's great just working with others and hearing their experiences and um particularly too in that paper we were able to highlight some case studies from the different areas um globally um to wow. showcase um, so it's it's a good paper that I think again too will um, get sent out to those of you that are here on the Zoom today. Um, it's uh, it's not technical. It's uh, maybe a little bit longer for a bedtime story, but um, I think it's a good read. And uh, we we've got some other um, some smaller bits of coverage. Um, by some media outlets that are maybe even more digestible, but there yeah, it's, it's great participating with a, a global network. I've learned so much from so many people that um, have way more experience with me, different experiences, but then I get to bring to the table some different perspectives working yeah. at an organization like Shed that has the opportunity to connect with people in a way that so many other types of institutions um, don't have. So it's it's great to have that as a lens. Yeah, I think all of us, especially on this uh, on this call, know what it's like to work in a team. <laughs> and so yeah. uh, being able to do it with folks from around the world, uh, it helps put that in perspective. All right, oh, Kara, we've got a lot uh, of questions that we don't have Good. time for, so don't worry. Oh. <laughs> um, for the folks that do have questions, if we didn't get to them, we're, we'll reach out uh, and answer them individually in the chat. Or if you have more that we weren't able to get to, please don't hesitate uh, to email us your questions as well. Okay, but I do want to end on this question because I know we've talked a lot uh, about the work, but this question is about you. So, okay. <laughs> Dr. Murchie, you spent uh, a bunch of time at a place that connects world connects the world with each other at the UN. Not all of us get that opportunity. So can you just share just pulling off the Dr. Murchie hat, Karen Murchie, the human, what was one of your favorite experiences that Ooh. you walked away with being a part of the world stage? Oh my gosh, this is the biggest question in the world. Wow, that is a big <laughs> question. Um <laughs> I guess one of one experience that just immediately like flashes uh, into my head is because so it was really neat to be at the United Nations and as a um, my badge allowed me to access certain areas and then there's like security checkpoints all over so oh, wow. going from different like rooms for different talks and so on a lot of people were getting 
um, shuttled through um, different corridors and so on. And some areas you had to access via security <laughs> controlled elevators and so on. Um, but being in an elevator then um, right away after face to face from a panel um, that I had I joined in the discussion, but the mayor of Rotterdam um, was standing next to me and his his talk was awesome. But then I was just face to face and I could just talk to him about what he was just saying in that whole yeah. session. And um, those impromptu opportunities, yeah. um, even though I never said who I was or anything, it, <laughs> it didn't matter because we could just share that moment. And there was a lot of those sharing the moment, even just of like waiting to get into a session or something where wow. conversations came up and, wow. you know, fe the feelings of like, um, maybe both of being like overwhelmed <laughs> again uh, by the gravity of the conversation to feeling energized um, by youth singing and being like, all right, we can do this together. We can like link arms and literally do this. So, wow. That's, yeah. uh, that's inspirational. Uh, and uh, I, I think I speak for everybody uh, when I say hashtag jealous. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I yes. wanted to make the most of it and being able to share some of that with a, an audience today is one way. Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, Dr. Murchie, I don't want to take up any more of your time. We have a couple of more things to share uh, yes. with, with some other people. But before we say goodbye to you, do we have do you have any last words of wisdom, advice, things that you'd like to say before we say goodbye to you this afternoon? Oh, my gosh. Make the most of your time on Earth. Do good things. <laughs> And be yes. nice to each other. <laughs> oh my gosh, I couldn't agree more. Dr. But I Marchie. think this is a this is already a great audience who yes. is doing great things. So oh, keep doing absolutely. it. <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. Dr. Murchie, thank you all so much. We've got so much thank yous in the chats. Beautiful job. Well done. Um, and so I'm going to give you some snaps before we, we say goodbye. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for joining in today. All right. And continue your hard work. I know you're uh, up in Door County right now, so I'm sure you're going to be heading outside yep. any moment now. <laughs> All right. Well, bundle up. I hear it's a little chilly today. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. All right. Whew. Friends, what an incredible time. Uh, that we just spent with Dr. Karen Murchie uh, representing and taking care of our freshwater ecosystems. But we are not done. So now I would like to introduce one more individual, um, Maggie Bird, who is going to take us out for the afternoon. I know it's tough to, to go after uh, Dr. Murchie in that regard. But uh, Maggie, good to see you. I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit and then I'll pull up all of our uh, remaining slides. Here we go. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. And completely agree. Very, very tough act to follow with Dr. Murchie. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Maggie Bird. I'm a fellow Shed Aquarium member and also a new member of our Shed Aquarium Auxiliary Board. Just wanted to take a few moments to, one, again, thank you to Dr. Karen Murchie, Director of Freshwater Research, for sharing Shed's freshwater conservation efforts, both locally and beyond. Um, and a big thank you to you all for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, together, we are ensuring that Shed continues to be at the forefront of conservation research. Um, Want to take just a few more moments to highlight our centennial commitment. Um, your continued commitment to a healthy and thriving aquatic world is critical to advancing our work and our mission. As we plan for the next century of curiosity, care, and conservation, we are thrilled to have you join our transformational centennial commitment. Um, this initiative is very exciting. It's surge forward that leverages nearly a century of success yeah. to accelerate our work for people, for community, and for aquatic life. Um, this vision will include deep community investments and partnerships a modernized aquarium experience, accelerated aquatic research and science, and so much more. Um, and we're really, really looking forward to the coming months and the years ahead. Um, and finally, just a few plugs for some upcoming events that we want you to be on the lookout for um, as a, a SHED member and an insider. Um, May 16th coming up is Immersion. So Immersion will be an evening of optimistic solutions-oriented conversation. 
um, with a focus on conservation um, and it will feature some of our freshwater experts. And then today's a little bit warmer if you're in the Chicago area, um, meaning summer is just around the corner, which means member Jazz and at the Shed will, will begin again. Um, so save the date for members Jazz in on June 14th. 14th for free entry and exclusive insights from shed experts um wow. and then members coming up will also have early access to register for kayak for conservation to learn how we are rewilding the chicago river um and then finally please help us continue to protect fresh water around the world as dr murchie said fresh water is life um your support continues sheds critical work to ensure healthy sustainable and biodiverse freshwater ecosystems in our own backyard and around the world. Um, and with that, I will just say thank you again for your time. Awesome, thank you, Maggie. And one more time, thank you everybody who, who joined us today uh, for this incredible, what, what are we now, 56 minutes of just remarkable stuff happening, uh, not just at Shed, but around the world. Uh, well, friends, with that note, I won't take any more of your lunch hour. Please take this next four minutes to do something for yourself, whether that's just taking a, a cup of fresh water, uh, now that we understand the importance of it. Um, tell somebody that you love them. Uh, but on behalf of everybody here at Shed, uh, from myself, to Maggie, to Karen, to everybody on this call. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you here at Shed Aquarium sometime soon. All right, everybody, enjoy the rest of your day and a fantastic weekend. Goodbye, everybody.